Steve Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan and Rockefeller Center, Newsstand Studios in New York City. Joined as usual with uh, John. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Peachy. Yeah. Yeah. Peachy, huh? Yeah. All the way to Peachy from yeah. last year, Chokey. I mean, last week, Chokey. This week, Peachy. I guess so. Yeah. 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 Rocking the panels. We got Joe Hazen. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Good yeah. to see you guys, everyone. Yeah, I'm sweaty as a as a. You sure are. See that? I thought I, for some reason I was like, I'm not gonna be sweaty today. I don't know why. I was like, my body's different than it's been my whole life. Nope. Nope. I gotta go to the demo later. I got uh, Nastasia. How you doing? Good. Yeah. Yeah. How's uh, yeah. How's it out there in on the uh, the other coast? Anything uh, good happening over there? It's good. Uh, well, do we have uh, do we have our good friend Jackie Molecules? Yes, sir. Ah, well, good, to, good, to, good, to, good to have you uh, for our hundred and first, hundred and first episode. Last week was our hundredth episode on this uh, fantastic network, and then in the upper, 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 upper left, left corner, Quinn, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Good. So, uh, before we begin anything, I heard on the uh, well, I sh- I I heard from Nastasia because she told me that they went out for a burger. And by the way, next week we have uh, George Motz on, who's uh, re re has a re-edition of the Great American Burger Book. Now, I was mailed this burger book to my house, and my wife looks at the burger book and says on it, right underneath the big, big, big title, Great American Burger Book, says, author of Hamburger America. Jen looks at me and goes, think this guy likes burgers? I'm like, no, probably not. <laughs> probably not. If you like write one book called The Great American Burger Book, and your other book is called Hamburger America. Like, what's the next? What do, you, what do you guys think the next title is? Burgers in America? Hamburgers across America, maybe? Yeah. More hamburgers across it. America? <laughs> American hamburger. Yeah, yeah. An American hamburger abroad? Oh. Yeah, which is, I'm going to ask him about that. I'm going to ask him if he's ever had a decent burger abroad. I think somebody could make a killing. Like, an American going to another country and opening up a burger spot would make a fortune. The yeah. burgers are just so different in other countries. You did different, i.e., worse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah we've had this discussion, but we'll have it with the Burger Expert. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't read the, the book yet. I, you know, I have until next Tuesday to read the book in its entirety, cover it with post-it notes, and have something reasonable to ask, right? Uh, and Patreon people, please ask, uh, you know, burger questions. Or call in, by the way. If you're listening on Patreon, mm-hmm. call your questions to uh, 917-410-1507. Uh, 917-410-1507. Now, um, isn't Mott's... The the isn't he the one that advocates smashing the onions in? Is that yeah. Wigan, that's a that's a style of burger from Oklahoma that he is a big proponent. Th- that's of. that's what I'm saying. He's the one who has gone all yeah. over the country and says this is the way to make a burger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oklahoma. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Never been to Oklahoma. Nastasi, what do they do in Oklahoma? What happens in Oklahoma? Do, do I know? Yeah, the wind it comes <laughs> sweeping down the plain. And the waving wheat sure smells sweet. When the wind comes right Wait, behind the rain. What? Can you tell the can you tell the Dropbox story, please? Oh yeah. Yeah. First let me do this. I heard when you were having a burger, a simultaneously too rare and yet overcooked gray hamburger in uh, the great city of Los Angeles, on your way to get this guys, ready? A Pauly Shore concert. No. Pauly Shore. <laughs> no, Jack- Jack was walking down the street and said, Pauly Shore is playing the comedy store. I'm going to get tickets. He okay. texted me. Yeah. And so how was it? That's like, freaking hilarious. I, I told you, you were either going to beat your head against the wall or you were going to love it. I feel like he yeah. has to, I feel like he's gone through so much humiliation that that's so good for a comic that he's got to be the funniest guy on earth at this point. Jack, what did you think? It was good. It was very dark and depressing, just how I like my comedy. Yeah, nice, nice. So, like, uh, yeah, but, he like doesn't look. He does not look good, you know. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> is is he still got the whole stoner persona or no? Like, what is a sixty like two or sixty three year old stoner persona like who looks depressed look like? So not like the Cheech and Chong when they got into that kind of era of their lives, you know, stoner feel, but like. Uh, Cheech Marin, apparently, incredibly smart guy, wins all of the celebrity trivia tournaments. Like, oh. the, like amazingly sharp dude. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, do not get in a trivia battle with Cheech Marin, apparently. Never met the man. Wow. I'm just hearing that. 
you know, no, Paulie Shore just looks not like um, it's not like a charming bad. It's just like a sad bad. Mm. If that makes sense. Sad stoner dad. <laughs> not dad. More like weird uncle. Uh, bachelor. Drunkle. Yes. Mm. <laughs> The drunkle. Yes. The drunkle. Hundred percent. Yeah, love it. That's good. That that sounds like it makes for for good, depressing, self deprecating comedy, which we all uh, enjoy, right? Anyway. Yeah. Well, I knew I had a secret feeling that even though Nastasia was dreading going, that she was going to have a good time. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Well. So far, Nastasia's uh, habit here is taking me to have the worst burgers in L.A., so I'm about to <laughs> well, you know, George you know what? Here, 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 here's what I would like you to do, Jack. I would like you to make a compilation of these horrible Nastasia-endorsed burgers, and we can discuss them next week with uh, someone who may or may not know something about hamburgers in the, uh, in the, state, you know, in the United States. You know what I'm saying? We're in America, so he should be able to help. I mean, some people would disagree, but yes, I agree. Anyway, <laughs> um, I agree. Uh, all right. So, uh, speaking of what Nastasi wanted me to speak of, not cooking, well, kind of cooking related, yeah. because if this had actually happened, like there would be no more cooking issues because there would be no, I, I would have, fortunately, I live on the fourth floor, so I would at most have like smashed up some of my bones had I just flown out the window Wall Street style after a crash. But, uh, cause I, oh my God, I get a text at midnight, midnight, right? Midnight 30, something like that. No, a call at midnight 30 from Nastasia. I'm like, I Nasta- yeah, I'm like, Nastasia's in LA. Her butt, her butt's dialing me. Cause our butts dial the phone quite a bit. Right. So she butt dials me and I'm like, you must've butt dialed me. What the hell? She's like, no, I erased the drop box. <laughs> Now, for those of you that don't know, like, literally everything that Booker and Dax has done since, since 2011 is stored on a Dropbox. So, like, all of the CAD files for all of our products, all of, like, the, the user manuals, like, all the Cooking Issues episodes, like, everything is on the Dropbox. And she's like, um, well... We don't have any money right now, so I can't afford to get a laptop with a bigger hard drive. And it was filling up my hard drive, so I said to to delete it, and it deleted it everywhere. <laughs> and that was it. That was that was it. And we were like, "Yeah." I was like, "Oh, I was like, I'm dead. I'm dead. You're dead. I'm dead. We're dead. That's it." Like you know what I mean? It's like we've been fighting our way through all of these problems. It's like, oh, it's gone. Company gone. Thank goodness. It turns out that Dropbox has a, maybe I shouldn't have done that button, that you can go back and get all your stuff back. But for that couple of minutes, I was just like, but you know how I am, Stas? Like, once I'm in a place where I'm completely and totally shafted, I'm like, I'm kind of like, okay, right? I mean, I was a little bit angry. I was a little freaked out at first. But then I was like, okay. Yeah, jump up and, like, unplug everything. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So as soon as she tells me, that it happened. Before I said anything, I jumped over my couch because my computer is still hardwired into the wall. I jumped over my couch and then just grabbed all of the cords, including the Ethernet cord, and ripped them out of the wall, hoping that it, like, if she couldn't recover it, <laughs> that it would only have deleted like a chunk of the Dropbox. And then I like jumped. Because, like, you know, I live in New York, right? So my internet is, like, up in a high, high closet somewhere, like, where all that stuff is. I went up there and just grabbed the router and ripped it out, like, ripped it out so all the cables, like, ripped out just to, like, shut the internet down. Like, shut the internet off. You know what I mean? Uh, But she was able to recover it. And thankfully, I didn't destroy any of my computers. So all's well that that ends well. And then 30 minutes later, I texted. I saw an email. Dropbox has noticed some unusual activity. I'm like, uh, everything okay, guys? Yeah, a little bit unusual. And Stasi's like, you're late to the party, Quinn. You're late to the party. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, that was a that was a joy, a joy. Yeah, let's do that again and again. Although it's not as much fun now that I know it can be fixed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you guys should know if you ever do this to your company that you can undo it at least on Dropbox, right? I think. Uh, well, For a certain yeah. amount of time, at least. 
By the way, they, right, do, they do give you a window. Folks, it was over it was over a terabyte of stuff. Over, Oof, wow. Like well over a terabyte of like all kind of internal documents. And then I was thinking, you know what? Like, anyway, whatever I want. I don't want to get into it. What don't, if, what don't if, you guys want to find out what that time limit is? Yeah, let's push it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if, if I go on vacation, if I go on vacation, Nastasi's gonna nuke the Dropbox. And then when I get back, she's going to be like, time's a ticket. If you had waited another day to notice, you would have been hosed. You know what I mean? Or maybe just delete big folders and not say anything, ones that I don't use for like a month at a time. You know what I mean? Anyway. No. Delete all of liquid intelligence. I, oh, my God. Well, she, thankfully, she doesn't have access oh. to that one. But get this. Get this. What's funny is, is that back when Nastasia and I were at the French Culinary Institute, she had the laptop, right? And... She would always threaten the, the 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 threat was that like you know if I ever did something that was like too over the top that she would just push the delete button and walk away. That was always the no, threat. I, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so this week in New York City is the Bar Convent Brooklyn, not the Brooklyn Bar Convent because they. No one needed another BBC acronym, right? So, like, it wasn't the, wasn't the bar, Jesus. the Brooklyn Bar Convent, <laughs> or the British Broadcasting Corporation, John, sure. get your yeah, mind yeah. out of the gutter. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's the BCB Bar Convent Brooklyn, which nobody understands why it's called that. Does anyone understand that? No. You know? No. No. How about, like, you know, Brooklyn Bar Festival or anything? I don't know. I guess they didn't want BB anything. BCB? People just call it the BCB because nobody wants to call it the bar convent, as far as I know. So last night they had the 15th anniversary of Ford's Gin at uh, Clover Club. Went there, saw Julie and a bunch of the crowd. It was nice. Today I'm doing a talk with uh, AK Hada, uh, formerly manager of existing conditions, and of course PDT, and now uh, you know one of the muckety mucks at Bacardi. Uh, and Jack Schramm, also, of course, Existing Conditions, Booker and Dax, and Solid Wiggles, and Garrett Richard, who uh, is going to come on again soon with Ben Schaefer about his new book, uh, Tropical Standard, uh, Tropic Standard, and um, obviously runs the bar program at Sunken Harbor, one of my favorite bars. Did he happen to work at Existing Conditions, too? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if you get... Uh, the talk is by, by a bunch of Existing Conditions people, and the subject is acid uh, and sugar adjusting. Right, but I'm gonna break out in public for the first time the succinic acid. So I mean, I know I've done it on the thing, but like the succinic acid is the answer for lime. It just brings the truth to the lime. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a what's it called here right now, right? So succinic lime juice, the acidity in lime juice, right? Uh, per hundred grams, right? You with me? Hundred grams. Okay, is Four grams of citric acid, right, per 100 grams. Two grams malic acid per 100 grams, right? 0 0.04 grams of succinic acid. 0 0.04. Very hard to make that solution, right? So instead, what I recommend people do, because uh, Quinn tells me, Right, Quinn? That Modernist Pantry is mm -hmm. now carrying succinic acid. It's not on their website yet, but it, it, ha it yeah, has they arrived. Will be soon. Yeah, they have yeah, it, they but it's not up on their website yet. So you can buy food-grade succinic acid from Modernist Pantry in an extraordinarily near future, as well as magnesium carbonate. They got both of them. Uh, magnesium carbonates for clarifying starch. Anyway, so what I recommend people do is make an 8% solution. So that's uh, 8 grams of uh, succinic acid and whatever 100 minus 8 is. What is that? 92, 92 yep. grams of um, 92 grams of hot water. Succinic acid doesn't dissolve very well, so eight percent is right at the solubility level of uh, maximum solubility of succinic acid, max. Uh, and right then, it is easy because it is half a milliliter per um, per hundred grams or five milliliters per liter of juice, which is much easier to measure. And uh, 100 mils is also 20 drops if you use an eyedropper. So it's easy to do small amounts and not have to bust out a scale that weighs, you know, that can weigh minuscule amounts of stuff. So that's what I would recommend doing if you use succinic acid. comes out to about I was wondering, two drops of drink. Could, could, you, could you also do a blend of citric and succinic? 
That was like the proper ratio. Well, I'm glad you asked that, Quinn. Here's the problem with making mixes of powders. Like this is an entire like this is an entire thing that like industry worries about is that powders, in order for them not to self partition, need to have almost identical particle sizes and densities. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it, like you know how you take like 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 a box of sand with bigger rocks in and you shake it and they'll stratify so the same thing mm -hmm. will happen with mixes so people who sell powdered mixes like for cakes and whatnot spend a lot of time worrying about although i guess not for a cake things that you scoop out like bisquick right they spend a lot of time mm -hmm. making sure that the stuff inside of it won't partition too much over time so i'd be worried because even if you look at citric acid and malic acid the stuff that you normally buy malic acid is powdered much more than the citric acid is typically i mean they don't have to be they can make the powder whatever size they want but typically that's what happens and um the issue with it being uh i mean th that's why I, we had a caller or we had a someone write in and ask us why you know malic makes them choke so much when they use it and it's just because the powder is finer and so it aerosolizes more and remember i spoke about how much i used to like to huff tang and eat tang huff and eat tang mm -hmm. and my mom would say please do not huff the tang don't huff the tang i love huffing tang though that, get that like burning sensation get that yeah. taste all in your mouth I love that tang totally great yeah i love tang tang delicious all right so uh before i get into uh the questions any uh oh and tomorrow i'm doing a Another talk at the Bar Convent Brooklyn uh, with uh, Campari USA where we have uh, Danielle Reed from Monell coming in talking about how our senses of taste are different. Our equipment is different. She's going to bring bitter stuff. And did you know this? I mean, people – okay, I can, I can spoil a little bit. Here's something I did not know. Ready? So we all – well, not we all – a lot of us know that there's this thing called PTC or prop that is some people find intensely bitter and some people can't taste it all, right? And the people that can taste it were stupidly called, I think, super tasters because they had the particular receptor to taste prop. And so it's a classic thing that people do where you hand out a bunch of these paper strips with prop on it and you pe people put it in your mouth and like, you know, a chunk of the audience is like, Aah! because it tastes so bitter and a chunk of the audience is like, meh, it's fine. And then a chunk of the audience is like, what, what, what? tastes like paper and i'm that guy tastes like paper uh turns out there are also a bunch of people a large group of people who can't taste quinine as bitter so there are people out there and i forget she knows more whether there's like particular uh like ethnicities or groups of people you know communities that it, it tends to be more prevalent in but there are whole chunks of people who don't taste tonic water as bitter and so, like, what must their experience be like of, like, any liquor with quinine in it? Any, like, you know, quinotos or any, you know, uh, cap course or, or tonic water. So we're going to do a, um, three different – we're going to do no, ton, no quinine so that people who can taste quinine can, I guess, see limeade, which is what people taste if they can't taste the, uh, the quinine. Regular quinine and double quinine. I did the math, and it turns out that double the quinine I normally use is right at the legal limit. Like, <laughs> just at the legal limit. Of 83 parts per uh, million quinine base in a, you know, in, in a beverage. It's just at the limit. Just there. So Quinn and I also spoke to Monitor's Pantry because I wanted them to be able to get quinine. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to be able to get quinine, but they're not willing to do it because the FDA says b – basically, you, you're not allowed to sell as a food to anyone something that has more than less uh, – sorry, more than 83 parts per million in it. And even the simple syrups that I use are way over 83 parts per million. I mean they're way under 83 parts per million in use. But, you know, no one's expected to drink the simple syrup, and so they're not going to get it. So we have to find someone who's willing to carry – Quinine, either quinine sulf uh, sulfate or quinine hydrochloride. We have to find someone's willing to do it because the average person isn't going to make a fake account as a school or a business, set up something with Spectrum Chemical, and then get the thing shipped to them. No, they're not going to do that. They should. <laughs> they should do that, <laughs> but they won't. If you're friends with anyone who works at a lab, just give them money and have them buy it on the lab's account. Remember – to get USP, United States Pharmacopoeia grade, so it doesn't have anything. I mean, it's all made from tree bark anyway. So, but just get the one that's pharmacopoeia, you know, US, just go USP. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, but get whatever's cheaper, the sulfate or the, uh, or the hydrochloride. It doesn't really matter. All right? All right. 
enough of that. Uh, any of you guys uh, got some uh, interesting food uh, garbage from the last week? Uh, I got some. All right, what do you got? I uh, I don't know if you remember this from our last tea-related episode, but I got some of my locally grown and produced tea. Ah, oh, all right. So what does tea taste like grown where it shouldn't be grown? I'm kidding. I'm messing with you. How is it? Is it good? Uh, so... <laughs> I got this thing. It's incredibly rare, but it turns out it was worthless, so don't worry about it. <laughs> no, it's... Okay, the aromas and the flavors are really good. However... I mean, that's pretty much the whole Megillah right there, so what's the however? What do you got? Okay. Again, the way I brew is gone through style. Okay. So for the uninitiated, at the high ratio of leaves to water... You're brewing small volumes of water, but you're bre- you're doing it multiple times in a row. Uh huh. Yeah. And the problem was it's really thin. Like mm. Mm. I flash brewed the first infusion, so probably like a seven second infusion. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, this is nice. It's a little light, but I expected that because I did it so quickly. And then I do the second infusion, which was like probably 15 seconds. And I'm like, oh no, this is already lighter than the first one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then did you just take some aside and just do, like, a standard, like, Jokomo, like, long, hot steep to see whether you would ever get anything out, to see whether it was, like, leaf geometry or what was going on? No, I just kept doing it. And again, nothing was unpleasant. It's just mm-hmm. really, like, uh, I'm wondering if it's a matter of just how long, how young the plants are. I mean, I don't know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel my inner Nastasia here and say they should probably leave it to the experts who've been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years. I don't know. Just, I don't I mean, know. I think, I think based on the <laughs> flavor and the aroma, I think they know what they're doing. I wonder if we get too much rain. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know. Listen, you know how, like, they grow wine grapes where wine grapes grow really well? And, like, and, like not we, in other places? We make really good wine here, too. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not saying... Okay, 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 you know how they grow kiwi fruits in places where kiwi fruits can grow? You know what I mean? Or like we, we passion fruits? Too. Oh my God. <laughs> Does everything grow on Vancouver Island, Quinn? I know you're a weird <laughs> microclimate. What I'm saying is, is that there are places on Earth that grow the best of X, Y, and Z, and maybe Vancouver Island is not the place that grows the best X, Y, and Z when it comes to tea. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Maybe. You know? I'm also wondering if part of the problem is that nobody at the company is brewing it the way I do it. Well, I mean, th- there are multiple issues here, Quinn, and it all goes back to what Nastasia Lopez always tells me is that why don't you just get the people who have the <laughs> best place for growing tea and who have hundreds of years of expertise who grow up with people who that's all they do and buy their stuff while you wait for these people to have a couple hundred years under their belt so that they can make the stuff that just is good. I mean, Nastasia, am I misstating what, what you tell me all the time? That's what you say, but you don't follow my advice. I'm up for doing it once or twice or trying it, right? I'm just saying that, like, you know... I, know, I, I just tried it, too. I know, but... Again, like, I, I've just had... I've had good results with these unusual... Local products. Okay. Like the olive oil. Olive oil was great. Oh, yeah? Well, you need to send... Listen, before you say the olive oil is great, you need to send that to Captain Oily, our boy Nick. Well, you can, you can buy his own olive oil. <laughs> oh, my God. He'll, say, he'll trade you an olive oil. What are we talking about here? Send him some oil, and why don't we get... All I'm saying is we happen to know a person who is a world expert, like a world expert on tasting olive oils of zillions of varieties from zillions of places over different years at different points in harvest. 
And if you happen to know that guy, I would just send him a small sample. That's all I'm saying. Am I wrong here? No. No. Nope. Right. So, yeah. Let's send him a sample. Booker and Dax will pick up the shipping. Send, send Mr. Oils a little bit of this fancy, fancy well, business. Maybe we should wait till next year, Clarvis. Uh, he can the, also taste know. around. He can taste around what happened between one of the. The, the man yeah, knows yeah, how yeah. to do it. If you're sending anything, send over some more of those uh, those chicory or hickory chips. Oh, the hickory <laughs> chips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also a big fan of the, of the cheesies, the Hawkins cheesies. Everyone's a fan of the yeah, Hawkins Yeah, we can do cheesies. a redo. Except for, like, uh, nobody likes the mouth noises from the Hawkins cheesies, but the Hawkins cheesies are a delicious product. Like, that's right up there. Like, Canadian products that, like, you know, should be everywhere, Hawkins cheesies, and real pea meal, pea meal bacon. Real pea meal, pea meal bacon is delicious. And not the not the rancid crap that we call Canadian bacon here in the United States, which is an abomination and nightmare. Not worthy of a sandwich. No, no. Real pea meal worthy of a sandwich. An egg sandwich mm. on a roll. Mm. Toronto. I got to go back to Toronto. I was close. I was in Rochester last week. Sure, just gone. Yeah. Oh, speaking of, get this. Uh, so I had a thought. You know how like uh, when a lot of terrible things happen and people who are good people worry about the actual problems, like the forest catching on fire and all of us having lung damage and all all that. What about the price of maple syrup next year? Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this harvest year, it was done. Doesn't yeah. matter. Over. Long over. Next year, is it gonna is it gonna suck? Now I know this is not a lie. Canada has a strategic reserve of maple syrup, right? Because it was, it was robbed once. You can look it up. There was a huge maple syrup robbery a long time ago. Uh, like, like, Not even that Like long tens ago. of thousands of gallons more. Like a lot of maple syrup was robbed. Who, 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 who did that? Another Canadian guy. Oh, man. I yeah. love this. Yeah, right? Maple yeah. syrup robbery. I mean, like, if you're going to steal something, why not steal something really heavy it's hard to move 3, around 3,000 tons is how much they took well 3,000 tons over the, over the course of several months it's not in one go it would be 3,000 tons alright so I can do this you ready so 3,000 uh, so we're trying you want to find into liters so 3,000 metric tons is 6,000 kilos right so 6,000 kilos divide by 1.33 and that's how many liters of maple syrup got stolen 1.33 because it has rough density of 1.33. So, because uh, it's two to one. So, that's a lot of maple syrup to steal. But point being, like, if all those forests are burning, like, what the heck's going to happen to the price of maple syrup? And especially the cost of that, that aged syrup they have. Well, if it's aged. Well, you want to, you, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to, that'll go up in a couple of years when exactly. this stuff goes down. Right. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, man, is that I got to have my syrup. Yeah. I got to have my syrup. So, you know, now is the time to stockpile. Like, you know, w next to the gold bricks that you keep under your bed, just, you know, get some, get some jerry cans. And instead of filling them with terror water, which is what I have, all the jerry cans in my house are filled with terror water for when, like, a, they're not just terror. Like, whenever there's a storm or power goes out, we don't have water. So I have, like, I have a couple of days of water in my house at all times. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. And just fill them with maple syrup instead. I have the cans, the really good ones, the ones that you could strap to the outside of a Jeep, not that I own a Jeep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Plus, I mean, maple syrup is hot water, so it's like, it's kind of like you also have yeah. emergency water. Yeah, I mean, um, that would be quite a, that, that's quite a thick water to drink. Let me tell you this. If you are laying down, if you are laying down five-gallon jerry cans of maple syrup, be sure to pasteurize those suckers before you, uh, before you put it in. So you have to like immerse the entire jerry can in water that's hot enough to kill the molds and whatnot because you don't want five gallons of maple syrup growing uh, mold. You just don't. Better yet, hot fill that sucker. Hot fill it. Take the maple syrup like in a giant five gallon pot, take it up to like 180, you know, Fahrenheit, like not, depends. The polyethylene can't take much more than that. So like 175 or like take it to 180, let it cool down to 175 and then maybe pre-dump hot water into your jerry cans and then put the maple syrup in, cap it right away. It'll form a vacuum. There will be no mold. I hate moldy maple. You ever Speaking had moldy of, maple? Uh, I've seen that, yeah. yeah. Awful. Yeah, sad. Disgusting. Speaking of syrup, yeah. that relates to our first 
first question. Uh, well, I don't know what's first. Oh, Steve, good one. Yeah, let me let me hit the centrifuge question first. Uh, because it's a centrifuge question, and you know what we sell? Oh, yeah, centrifuges. yeah, centrifuges. Correct. Correct. If you where, said where can, we, they go, where, where, where can they get a centrifuge? I believe you can go to uh, a, a little website known as ur.cool forward slash binzall. <laughs> that's ur.cool forward slash binzall, where you can still order one. Yeah, that's right, people. If you order one, you are cool. You are dot cool. <laughs> slash binzall. Oh, boy. Spinzall, spinzall, spinzall. You know what? I wish that, like, I had, like, lived a separate i don't want to not have lived my life but i also would like to have been a guy that, that goes to monster truck rallies and like helps announce and stuff like that you know what i mean yeah i think i would have enjoyed it damn son where'd you find this there you go yeah yeah sweet oh, wow Joe. well done yeah i mean like i could have gotten a job at yonkers raceway i feel like pretty i, I feel like i could have gotten a job at raceway park i feel like i could have anyway um Fupjack says, most of the centrifuge recipes I've heard are for getting a clear liquid out, and I assume tossing the solids. Now, nah, you do not need to toss the solids. This is a good question. Are there any interesting usage for, uh, uses for the solids from a centrifuge run? I know part of the answer is depends on what you were centrifuging, etc. Well, all of the answer is depends on what you're centrifuging. But I'll give you a few good solids. One, uh, I happen, one of my favorite things to make is the is the pseudo butter that we make. It's not actual butter because it's not fully inverted but it's that super creamy it's still got like a lot of the buttermilk in it but like that the like the spins all like butter is like i think hyper on point nastasia even likes that she hates most of the things i make correct nastasia correct yeah so that's the solids and then you can use the buttermilk you can do it cultured or not it's up to you just make sure the stuff's cold when it goes in right two uh and this is a real weird one you can fractionate fats so you can you can take uh, like chick- this this is really experimental okay like don't come back to me and say that it was a pain in the butt but you can take like chicken fat and then uh, melt it and then put it in and then spin it as it chills and it will spin out the solids and then you can get the solids that solidify first and so you can make a schmaltz pie crust which is fun you do it once this goes back to Quinn's tea you do it once just to say you've done it. And then you're like, I wish I could buy that product because it would be delicious. But oh, hell no, I'm not going to make that again. Uh, spinning out uh, Greek yogurt into labne or spinning regular yogurt into Greek. You use the solids. You can also use the whey leftover, but it's a good way to do that because it makes it real dense. Uh, look, when you're blending olives and you want to get like hyper tapenade, mm, you can use the solids. And you're doing fruits, you can take uh, like one of the best things. Remember uh, when we uh, handed uh, Long? Remember Long, Stas? Love, yeah. love him. Love Long. Long was the best. I think, where is he now? Is he in Taiwan now? Anyway, so like, and he went to Per Se. We're like, why are you going to go to Per Se? You don't need to go to Per Se. You already know everything. Why do you need to go to Per Se? And he went to Per Se anyway because he wanted punishment. And anyway, so uh, for like two years he went to Per Se. That's a lot of punishment. It's a lot of punishment. For what? Anyway, so uh, we handed him uh, a bunch of peach from the bottom of uh, the centrifuge buckets because Nastasi and I had to mix it with bourbon for a cocktail we were making. And he added uh, a little more simple syrup. This is all he added. A little simple syrup. And then LN, LN spun it like, like it was ice cream and made like a frozen uh, peach pie. That was good. That was real good. Because it didn't have an ice cream texture. It had more of like a pumpkin pie texture. But it was cold and it was like all peach. All peach. 100% peach. Good. Good, right, Stas? That was like amazing, yeah. Yeah, good, and and fast, and for something we were going to throw away. So you can the things that I think taste terrible are uh, when you're spinning tomatoes. If you are, if you don't peel the tomato, if you peel the tomatoes, then everything is good. The stuff tastes like the stuff that's left over tastes like um, like to, like tomato uh, paste, right? The seeds go all the way to the back, so you can harvest the seeds out. If you seed it. Before you put it in, then the solids basically are tomato paste, right? And then clear tomato water. The skins are gross. Skins, tomato skins are gross. They're bitter. They're not good. Uh, 
which is weird, right? Because the highest skin amount that you can get on a tomato are the grape tomatoes, but they're also really sweet. But when you spin them, they get a lot of the bitter seed thing in them. So actually, I prefer the larger Campari tomatoes if I'm not going to bother peeling them. But really, sometimes it's better just to, and I hate to say this, spin uh, spin tomato juice. Because if you spin tomato juice, there's no seeds or skin to worry about. Whatever. Um, what else is real real nasty? The tannins at the bottom of a nut spin, the very bottom tannins on a nut spin, like pecan skins, aren't the best. Uh, but most of the stuff you can use. We used to sp- spin nuts, and you have both the nut butter and the oil, and you can use both. So a lot of times you can use both. All right. Covered. Smothered, right? Steve Goodwin writes in, uh, last year I took your recommendations to forage for linden tree blossoms and made a one-to-one simple syrup. Turned out delicious. However, after about a week or so in the fridge, I discovered what looked like mold on the surface. Is there anything... Uh, whether it's the addition of a preservative or maybe a change to my procedure that you would recommend to extend the shelf life. Um, I may change this year and use the syrup to make kombucha. Let me know what you think. Jeez, I don't know. Like, if mold's happening that fast, I wonder whether you had, like, some temperature issues in your in your fridge or maybe it's just there's so much stuff on the linden blossoms when they're freshly collected that it's just, like, kind of hyper-inoculated. Um, I've never heated linden up but again if you heat it up much above 150 or so 160 you should kill most of the mold that's in it and um that should knock it back i usually heat stuff up though to like i should have looked up the numbers but like 160 maybe someone can look up while i'm doing this like what the number you need to hit to kill the mold is or you could add preservatives but that's kind of a pain in the patootleheimer right any sort of you could either acidify it that'll help or you could um I mean, you could hit it with, like, benzoate and sorbate and all that stuff, but I don't know. I just try heat, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know. I've never made kombucha. Can I say that? He said he said, he said said he might change gears and use it to make kombucha. I've never made kombucha. Hmm? That would be good. I've made plenty of kombucha. Okay. That checks out. I'm saying it's like, you know, like, at a certain point in your life, you have to be like, that's not the thing I'm going to do. You know? Like... I brewed plenty of beer in my life, and I loved it. And, of course, it was all grain because, please, come on. You know what I mean? But, like, uh, after my second son was born, I was like, nope. Don't have the room or the whatever. Although, is it unethical to teach my son how to homebrew in his college dorm? No. No? My wife thinks it's a bad idea. But I think, like, why not have access to, like, decent beer that you make Yeah. instead of having to go buy rot gut? Yeah. You know? I mean, when I was his age, the best beer was free beer. Well, that's, yeah. It took me a long time to outgrow that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anyway. In some ways, I'm still like, the best like beer free. Is still free beer, I would say. No, come on, man. You're telling me that if someone's like, I will hand you this free insert beer that you hate, or you could just pay five bucks and have the beer that you liked... That you would take the free beer? Oh man, I don't know. Toss up. Now I know that you. I love. I love free things. I love free things. Okay, I'm gonna give you like, f- like as much free barefoot merlot as you can as you <laughs> can pound, <laughs> or you're spending ten dollars a glass on something that's moderately not as barefoot merlot. Uh. I know. I'm on a real money saving kick right now, Dave. I the, get that, the, but the, you the, the terms have changed. You you threw out he a only, woman. He only pays for Polly Shore. Uh well, you know, <laughs> apparently worth it. Worth it. Worth it. I didn't no. throw the woman out. I still dated her for a little while. <laughs> mm, how many bottles could you handle? How many bottles of barefoot could you handle before you're like this relationship is over? Over. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Fair um enough. Oh, by the way, Steve's method was, oh, my God, this is a lot. Uh, Steve Goodwin gathered a four-quart Cambro of linden blossoms. That is not easy on the streets of New York because people walk by, what are you doing? Yeah. (laughs) What what are you doing with the flowers? And then you tell them, and they're like, oh. And then that happens. And then you got to be like, those aren't your flowers. You can't take them. I'm like, in fact, they are. Die. You know what I mean? We were collecting mulberries once in McCarran Park for MoFat, and somebody sent the cops over, and we had to stop. Why, though? Public, like, the public property, if one person starts doing it, everyone's going to start doing it. And? Yeah. If one person gathers these fruits that are going to fall on the ground and stain everything, then everyone will do it, and the ground won't be stained. And then what, John? And then what? I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) 
Then no old folks will slip on the berries and ruin their outfits and break their bones. Then what will happen? Doctors will be out of work. Yeah. All because you wanted to forage mulberries. Ridiculous. Yep. People are dumb. Yeah. Here's the other thing. Like, once somebody gets in their mind that, that you're doing something that they wish they somehow could do, then they call the cops on you. And even if there's not a rule, like, the cop, the cops... They don't, they're not going to have the energy to be like, is this a rule? Is this person yeah. allowed to do this? They're just going to tell you to stop. Yeah. Which is garbage. Garbage. Yep. Anyway, irritating. People are irritating. You know what? Here's an idea. Leave people alone. Someone's out there picking mulberries. You know what you should do? Mind Nothing. your own business. Yeah, mind your own business. Mind your own business. I mean, you can pick them also. Yeah, that's minding your own business. Although, I think it's bad form to pick right on the tree that someone's picking on. Yeah. Go find your own tree. Go find mm. your own tree. Yeah. Or make a note that they're picking off that tree because they probably know what they're doing and then go back when they're gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. True. That's the slick move. Yeah. I mean, don't be mean about it. You know what I'm saying? But whatever. Uh, all right. Oh, so he gathered four quarts of uh, blossoms, covered them with boiling... Oh, covered them with boiling water. That should have gotten rid of the mold. Something's going on here, uh, Steve. If you cover them with boiling water, let them chill in the fridge overnight, strain out the liquid, and dissolve an equal amount of white sugar and store it in the fridge, they should not have... It should not have molded. Something happened. You got seated with something. Your temperature, like, got all wonks. Something happened. Um, I mean, depending on the container, it could have just dropped real hard when they poured... The water over. You know? mm, four quarts? No. <laughs> I mean, like, four quarts? Like, unless his container was, you know, uh, a Chevy, like, you know, small block engine that he used to pour this stuff in, like, the thermal mass is, I mean, that's a lot. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know what, I, I can't tell you what happened there, Steve. I can't tell you. Reheat it. Reheat it. In the, Here's what I do. So, like, uh, what I, when I, Last bought back to maple syrup. I bought like a bunch of gallons of maple syrup. I got ball jars, uh, like quart ball jars, and I filled all the quart ball jars almost to the rim, sealed them down, and then water processed them so that I only had to finish a little bit at a time. Do that. All right. Ben King, I was reading a blog post about pressure infusion technique and read in the comments that rapid depressurization essentially gives the solids the bends. Well, remember, bends is nitrogen, not nitrous. All right, but yes, I mean, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying, Ben, but just please don't do anything to make people think that nitrogen and nitrous are the same, right? Um, Gives the cells the bends, rupturing the cells. I don't know about that. I don't know if it ruptures cells. I would have to do some actual, like, pictures with a microscope. We're getting fishbowl and waved at. Um, And allowing for better and faster uh, flavor transfer into the liquor. The article mentions that the technique was proposed by Mr. Fizz on YouTube. That's incorrect. Uh, who uses it for marinating chicken. That is correct. Uh, so what happened is I invented the uh, technique. I saw Mr. <laughs> That's what happened. I invented the technique. <laughs> Mr. Fizz, there's a well-known vacuum marination technique, and what Mr. Fizz did was use pressure marination, right? He wasn't trying to make flavored liquor or flavored liquids. He was trying to force marinades into chicken, Right, And he did a couple of tests. And what I said was, what we can do is use the shifting pressure of nitrogen, nitrous. See, you're killing me now. You're killing me, Ben. You can use the the shifting pressure of nitrous, which is much more soluble than nitrogen. Force the liquid in to the product, which is kind of like what Mr. Fizz is doing. But you know what Mr. Fizz didn't want to have happen? He didn't want to have the liquid boil back out because he's trying to marinate the chicken. You know what I wanted to have happen? I wanted all the liquid to boil back out because what I'm trying to do is flavor the liquid, right? So Mr. Fizz, whatever, it's a canard. I'll tell you something else. <laughs> I called up the EC Corporation and I said, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You've never heard of it before. They're like, come on. People have used this forever. You didn't come up with anything we haven't heard before. Told them the rapid, told them rapid technique. They're like, oh yeah, we never heard of that before. Never. Never heard of that. That's all you. I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> so I was aware of Mr. Fizz at the time. Not the same. 
uh, I don't know who wrote the article, but you can tell them, you're like, hello, sir, or madam, or whatever, incorrect. You know, here's the other thing. People write histories, don't know jack squat. Anytime you read a history, right, even if the people who are telling you, like me right now, telling you, right, I was there, I know because I did it, right, but, you know, people say things to suit their own narrative 100% of the time. And people who write histories choose very small percentages of the narrative. Just go back and read any history textbook and see how cherry-picked that garbage is. You know what I mean? Like, reread the textbooks from when, like, I was a kid if you really want to see what cherry-picking looks like. You know what I mean? That's why I very rarely get mad at other people's cherry-picking because I'm like, meh, all history is cherry-picking. Yeah. But you know what else? Cherry is delicious. Uh, so back to Mr. Fizz. Uh, the article mentions the technique was proposed by Mr. Fizz on YouTube who uses it for marinating chicken. Uh, I did a little research and saw a paper discussing ultrasound cavitation. Not cavitation! People, if I hear one more person say that this works because of cavitation, people love to put technical terms on things without actually doing the research. It is not cavitation. All right? It's not cavitation. You can use cavitation. It's a different process. Right? So... It, it's also like, and I love some of the people who have pushed this, I don't believe there's a cavitation situation going on in blenders either. Everyone's like, oh, blending, it's all about cavitation. Oh, really? Okay. Um, then why aren't the blades getting destroyed? You know what I mean? Like, why doesn't it... it, it, it <laughs> you're entraining air in a blender. That's where the air bubbles are coming from. Cavitation is literally where you're using force to create a vacuum bubble where there was nothing, right? That's cavitation, and it's real damaging to things. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and you can use ultrasound to do—that is what ultrasounds do. Ultrasound, like, when you go, and you're making that awful noise, and you're doing that is, in fact, what ultrasounds are doing. Not, I believe, what blenders are doing, and not what's happening when you're pressure infusing. You're literally just opening a bottle and letting the gas fly out like you would with seltzer water. But— it doesn't taste like seltzer. So you're forcing gas in, the liquids are in, it's in the pores, you open it up, it starts bubbling out, the liquid comes out. That's simple. You don't need, like, cavitation. You don't need Mr. Fizz and his chicken marination. You just need that. Um, anyway, uh, I thought I could use either CO2 or N2 tanks. Not N2. Not N2. N2 is not soluble. Oh, wait. It is somewhat soluble, so people get bit. N2 is soluble in water. Yes, microsoluble, like on the order of 30 times less, or be, depends on whether you're talking about fats, alcohols, or, or, or water, but n nitrogen is on the order of 20 to 60 times less soluble in, in any of those things than uh, nitrous is, okay? So nitrogen is a terrible thing to use to infuse with. What nitrogen does in liquids, like in the nitro things, which is a terrible term because nitro can mean either nitrous or nitrogen. What nitrogen does is instantly come out of solution when you depressurize and form micro bubbles. And it works best in things like Guinness that have a nucleation site already, carbon dioxide. So Guinness has a small amount of carbon dioxide because it's not super bubbly, right? They then let the nitrogen go in it and it forms, boom, a huge amount of instant micro bubbles that form a more stable Guinness head and that cascade effect. That's what nitrogen is for, not for infusing. And it's because people use terms like cavitation when they shouldn't that they confuse and think that nitrogen is going to work for these infusion tricks when really what you want is nitrous oxide and not CO2 because it's going to make the taste carbonated. Um, okay, I have in my house a keg system to induce cavitation on a larger scale. Not cavitation. Here's my problem with kegs. I have done nitrous kegs before the issue with uh, if you look in the book if you look in liquid intelligence i have in it a document that was given to me a uh, table that was given to me by the ec corporation where they measure the actual pressure that's inside of a uh, whipper uh, under different conditions so you ha look at those pressures in order to maintain those pressures in a standard keg unless you disassemble the keg and change out the fittings Nine times out of ten, because we used to use kegs to do rapid infusion with, with nitrous N2O tanks at existing conditions because we weren't going to pay for all those whippers, right? This, the, the safeties go off and it sucks because you're working right at the level of where the safeties blast off. So you have to write your recipes to go longer with a slightly lower pressure if you're going to do it. But use nitrous, nitrous N2O. Uh, did I cover some of that or no? Yep. 
The paint, oh, paint pots. He's not using a keg, he's using paint pots. Max pressure, 60 PSI. Yeah. Um, is that enough pressure? You're going to have to change the recipe. The advantage of using a keg system over a bottle system is that uh, when you're using a, a keg system, you no longer need to worry about how much product you have in it. When you're using whippers, it, you're using a specific number of grams, and so you have to be extremely aware of how much uh, product you put into the whipper because that's going to change your ultimate pressure. Once you dial in your recipes, and I would go as high a pressure as you possibly can, and then just figure out how long it takes at that pressure. But once you dial in your recipes, right, you can make a full keg. Not full. It has to still have shaking room, right? But you're gonna, you can make an almost full keg or you can make an almost empty keg, and the result's going to be the same because now you're functioning with a pressure and not with a number of grams. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. And by the way, uh, Ben, thanks for writing in and letting me rant on uh, on some of these confusions because I literally just had to rewrite a whole section of this for something else anyway, so I appreciate it. Um, ooh, Sargon following up on his lime powder from last week. Uh, my core audience loves vodka and soda. Uh, I like to put on a show when they come over, and it's sometimes unplanned. My protocol thus far has been add vodka and ice plus a little uh, – er, I can't even pronounce it – Erythritol. There you go. Thanks, man. Uh, but that's a secret because they all, quote-unquote, hate sugar. To a shaker, I shake until chilled. I measure out the dilution, add extra cold water, carbonate, have them grab a pipette with lime acid and or champagne acid and have them add it, carbonate again, drop in a chilling bath until uh, final product is some, some time, sometime between 12 and 18%. But 18 is a lot, man. You're going to get people on the floor. Uh, I mean, it works, but you're going to get on the floor. Do you think freeze-dried lime juice, which is dirt cheap and readily available and sucks less, is worth? Is, is it worth the effort? I, fi uh, I find that there's definitely a different feel to the drink versus lime acid. Have you tried the succinic, Sargon? Have you tried the succinic? Have you tried the succinic? Here's what I'm going to recommend. Try the succinic and then come back and talk to me. Try the succinic and this is a cheat. Put a, a lime wedge on the edge of the glass so they can smell actual lime aroma because the acids don't have the aroma. So if you put the lime wedge on the, on the glass, they have the aroma of the fresh lime, and they have the succinic, which fools them into thinking that it's real. I don't know. It might be better they than the powdered lime. I don't know. They also asked about introducing lime aroma with the lime oil. I, I suggested that in the chat at the time just infusing some lime zest into the vodka. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I would not use... Uh, Oil, because oils don't ever taste like the thing that they come from. They're all good, but they don't taste like the thing that they mm -hmm. come from. This is why flavor houses are in business, because this is what they do for a living. Um, anyway, but if you can make the, the freeze-dried lime powder work, I mean, or you know what you could do? Sorry, you could just clarify a little lime juice. You just clarify a little lime juice. You don't even, you don't even, like, you don't even just, just let it rack out. Just let it rack out. Just hit it with SPL and uh, Kiesel Saw, and maybe even just SPL and Kiesel Saw if you're not going to use a centrifuge, and just see how far it racks down over the course of like a couple of hours to cant off the top, you know? Um, and then make up the rest with acid. Um, all right. So, also from Sargon, spins all question, how come my normal centrifuge heats up liquids a ton and the non-refrigerated model can't run much more than 30 minutes without starting to cook stuff, and how does the spins all do it without that? That's a very good question. I like questions like this. Uh, so if you look at a centrifuge with swinging buckets, right, what they're doing is swinging a bucket around, and there's a huge amount of uh, air resistance, and that air resistance uh, it is from friction, and that friction heats everything up. And so it doesn't sound like waving something through the air would heat it up that much, but guess what? It really really, really does. And so uh, almost all of the energy that's being used to maintain the speed of that centrifuge as it's up there isn't really in the bearings, right, which is where a lot of it, it's in the air resistance that it's overcoming. So because it has these giant buckets that are swinging around, that's what's heating it up. And it heats up substantially, like 20, 30 Celsius uh, over the course of a long run. It's crazy, which is why I only ever used to buy refrigerated centrifuges because, hey, I'm no chump, right? And so you use a refrigerated centrifuge and you can take care of that, but you need a decent-sized refrigerator to make up for the fact that you're dumping all this energy in the form of uh, air resistance. A tube centrifuge has the... Okay, so a tube centrifuge where the tubes are entirely captive inside of an aluminum rotor does not have this problem. And the spins all doesn't have this problem. Well, they still have a little bit of problem because there's just nothing to catch the air, right? So a spins all rotor, when you look at it, right, there's, it's very aerodynamic. So it's not, doesn't have a lot of air resistance, 
much less friction. Less friction, less problem. The more friction we come across, the more problems we see. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dave Kleiman, overcooked pork rib sous vide with a little bit too much koji. Take on that powdery, bromelated sort of unpleasant texture. Before I touch the whole batch, is there anything good I can make from all this? Ooh, I don't know, man. Uh, you know I, what? I, I, I croquettes. Thought. Croquettes. <laughs> Grind yeah. that crap up, make croquettes. Everybody loves croquette. I, I was going to say, just go all the way. More, ko- more koji, salt, water, make a, a garum. Make a what? A garum. A garum. Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's a sauce. You know I mean? That's, yeah. a, that's a whole different. I mean, like, if you want to yeah, use the cook stuff, like, add, it's too shreddy. I don't like stuff when it's overdone. You could do, I would say, like, the question is how fibery is it? I don't know if you can make, like, uh, pork floss from stuff that's already been cooked that hard. Probably, maybe. Maybe. I, uh, can I make you a little, Good. can I make you a little, uh, a little, what's it called? I buy my pork floss. I don't make it. I don't make my own salmon floss. I don't make my own pork floss. Because I live in an area where I can walk less than 10 minutes and buy giant tubs of pork floss for almost nothing. And it's delicious. Just the right amount of sugar. Just the spices I like. So I don't make it. Know what I mean? I totally. Know. Yeah. Um... Patrick writes in, uh, did they give a recipe for Maine rather than Boston baked beans on a previous episode? If choose, oh, I don't know they did. I think huh. you did. Maybe I did. I can get another one. We'll put it up on the Patreon. We'll talk, we'll talk beans. Uh, if choosing between Soldier, Marfax, or Yellow Eye, what direction do you suggest? Okay, listen. I mean, it's, it's six of one, 12 of the other, right? So, like, they're all different. I like Soldier a lot. I also like Yellow Eye. Marfax are different. So if you have access to Marfax and you haven't cooked them before, get some Marfax just because it's a different texture bean than the other ones. It stays really firm even after you've cooked it for like a a long time. Uh, I like Marfax. Um, But Marfax is the most regional of those beans. So like yellow eyes, you can get other places. Uh, You know, um, soldier beans, you can get other places. Jacob's cattle beans, you can get other places. But... um, Marfax is really just in Maine. So if you want to go like super local and even piss off a bunch of Maine people who don't use it, who aren't from the area of Maine where it's from, go Marfax. Everyone wants to do that, right? I didn't get it. Yeah. Um, I have some beans. Uh, I've been having a problem. My beans got a little hot. And so now they're taking a long time to cook. It irritates the hell out of me. Are you familiar with this, with persistent hardening in beans? No. So for those of you that have beans, I mean, you know, Steve Rancho Gordo will tell you, that uh, you don't want to keep your beans too long. But if you live, if you keep your beans in a, in a hot s- situation, especially with humidity, they develop what's called uh, kind of persistent hardness where mm. the pectin is actually reinforced and they won't get soft. And that's when you need to start doping baking soda in even if you have, uh, you know, really soft water like, like we do here in the States, uh, in, in uh, New York. Anyway. Or finish your question, but uh, I have one thing to say before. I'll well, say it now. Uh, for all the Patreon members, Edward just got back to me about a Cooking Issues listener discount that I just posted on the Patreon and in the Discord. It's 15% off uh, orders of $225 or more. And yeah, he's got great products again, so go check his site out, edwardsagemeats.com. And again, everything is in a post on the Patreon. Andrew Cummings writes in, Jackie's post about getting a vac- uh, based on Jackie's post about getting a vacuum sealer, it would be interesting to hear what Dave thinks about his old blog post regarding low-temp cooking. Still pretty accurate, or we changed some things now that he's had many years' experience? Uh, both. Uh, they are still fairly accurate, but I think uh, the thing that I do now a lot more than I did is drop the temperature. I understand a lot more now about... Uh, the drift that proteins have over long periods of time at a particular temperature. So I drop temperature for my soak, um, if, if that makes sense what I'm talking about. When, I'm, when I say soak, I mean soak at a temperature. Um, but, I, but everything on there is still, I think, pretty accurate. Let me know if it's not, and then I will we'll rant on it one way or the other. I'll either mea culpa and just mention what kind of a butthead I am, which is a known fact, or I will say no, I'm, I'm still right, like Schopenhauer, who wrote two books Dave, you should 50 years apart. Uh, you know what, Quinn, man? Seriously. Uh, Jonathan Overhouse, what are Dave's thoughts on adding eggs to pie dough? Pros, cons, worth doing. I have not tried it. I don't, so here's why I don't want to, No one wants a pie dough tough, and I think the proteins are just going to toughen it up. 
Uh, I wouldn't do it, but I'll do some research. Quinn, put that back on. I'll do some research about why people think. Uh, I mean, I ain't putting, I ain't putting eggs in a pie dough. You put in egg, egg yolks, maybe. No whites. No hell no. Um, what do I have? Up. Oh, mm. All right. John RS on Instagram had an EC thing, but I think we've already talked enough about EC. So next week it's burgers, 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 burgers. Write in your questions for burgers, cooking issues.